Jim Crow was born in the late 1800s. The concept of separate but equal had enveloped the minds of white Americans across the country. An originally corrupted caricature created by whites to symbolize the over-exaggerated ideas of the colored community. Jim Crow now represents one of the darkest eras of race relations in America's history. In 1896, a case Plessy v. Ferguson deemed that the society would be separate but equal. Colored were treated as lesser class, and though things were separate, they were never equal. The whites and colored lived in two completely different worlds. It was obvious who had gotten the short end of the straw. One of the worst areas of separation during this time was in education. The colored schools were small, crowded, and very undersupplied. The teachers were usually undereducated, which reflected it in the students' poor education, putting them far behind the white students. One man, Oliver Brown, was the first to challenge the school system and change the vastly different and very unequal segregated schools. Brown thought integration was the best way to solve the unequal schools and took his proposal to the courts. Brown fought long and hard to prove that segregation of schools violated the 14th Amendment. Though the deliberation was long, the vote was unanimous, and integration of school was, was to begin. The enforcement of Brown v. Board did not, however, change the white world perspective of African Americans, and the amount of optimism was drastically different on different sides. I was taught to be respectful of a nigger, as they were in my home, and I had a maid to bring me up, but I was not taught to socialize with them. I think it gets the white and the colored students mingled. I don't think there, there will be any conflicts between them. And, uh, because I've lived with white people before. I am a veteran. And I slept with them. I ate with them. And we got along fine. Nearly three years after Brown versus Board was settled in the town of Little Rock, Arkansas, nine African-American students volunteered to be the first integrated color students to attend Central High School. Dubbed the Little Rock Nine, this group included Minnie Jean Brown, Elizabeth Eckford, Ernest Green, Thelma Ware, Melba Beals, Carlotta Lanier, Terrence Roberts, Jefferson Thomas, and Gloria Ray. On September 4, 1957, the first day of the school year, anti-integrationists gathered in front of the high school to protest the Nine of people out front and we were entering the site and I could just get a glimpse of this group and in the car I could hear on the car radio I could hear that there was a mob and I knew what a mob meant and I knew that the sounds that came for the crowd were very angry. To avoid the riots the students planned to meet with Daisy Bates and walk into the school unnoticed through the back entrance. All the students were informed of this change except for Elizabeth Eckford whose family did not own a phone. Eckford arrived at Central and endured the mob's intimidation and taunts alone. Multiple times she tried to enter the school but was blocked by the National Guard, who were sent there specifically by Governor Favis to prevent any of the nine from entering the building. Because of the violence and the guard, all nine were forced to go home. President Eisenhower took action against this injustice by bringing the National Guard under federal control and forcing Favis to comply with the Brown v. Board policy. He then brought in the 101st Airborne Division to protect the Nine and to keep the peace. Twenty days after their first attempt, the Little Rock Nine entered Central High School and attended their first day of classes at a newly integrated school. Attending school regularly was a small victory for the Nine. A difficult year still stood ahead of them. The Nine were regularly harassed, verbally threatened, and spat on in the hallways. This abuse did eventually take its toll, and though all Nine were treated equally poor, Minnie Jean Brown was the only one to retaliate and be expelled. After this incident, many students passed out cards and signs saying, One down, eight to go. The remaining eight made it through the rest of the school year, and on May 27, 1958, Ernest Green became the first African-American student to graduate from Central High School. To prevent any other desegregation attempts, the next year, Governor Fabus closed down Little Rock's entire school district, which forced the remaining seven to search for education elsewhere. It would take many more years for the African Americans to gain worth and equality in the white man's eyes, but the events at Little Rock brought forth one undeniable fact. 
For one of the first times in America's histories, white and African American students received a combined and equal educational opportunity. And these nine students set an example for future generations to come.